turned on and say that again. I really do love being with you all. Um, that uh, song we just sang was a prayer that God would meet us in this place. Um, and, and it's a really pretty profound thing that we come together and we get to experience a little bit of, of family with each other, but even more so that God just meets us where we're at. And um, one of the unique things I feel like about Harbor is that it's a place where you can just come wherever you are, however you're doing, and, and, and bring, your, bring yourself. And um, today as we get into this sermon, it's definitely, um, I invite you to keep that attitude. Bring your life. Uh, you don't have to set it aside. Just come right where you're at, and we're going to look at how Jesus encounters some folks, and um, we're exploring this concept of freedom. What does God, what does it mean for God to set us free, and how does God do that? And um, the whole series has been kind of built around, um, well, a lot of scriptures built around one verse, which is, is simply this, that um, John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I've come that you might have life, and have it to the full. God's plan for us is to give us a rich, full life. And, um, but there's other forces out there that would seek to still kill and destroy our life. And so we're caught in this tension of, of trying to find life. Um, and how that's done is by bringing ourselves to God. So, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a passage for us, and we're going to pray, and then we'll, um, we'll get into it and, and listen to God and see what he has to say. So we're going to look at um, Luke chapter 13, and it's uh, verses 10 through uh, 17, and uh, this wasn't the passage I was originally going to preach. Uh, I went to go look up the passage I was going to preach, and I'm like, that has nothing to do with freedom. <laughs> um, but I, I came here, and it's got a lot of stuff in it. I'm still working it out, but, but it's good stuff. So let me read it for us, and then we'll pray. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over. She could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days. Not this one, not the Sabbath. And the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, who is a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for eighteen long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what binds her. And when he said this, all of his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things that he was doing. Let's pray. God, we are caught between uh, being bound and being free. And, and yet here we are. We're in the synagogue, in the place of worship. We're in the church. Um, and we come to worship you with however our life is going, whether we're feeling free and greatly alive and thankful, or whether we are feeling burdened and bound and tied up. So, God, have your way in this crowd, in this gathering, just as you had your way in that one. We bring our lives to you and we love you. Amen. Amen. All right. Man, crippled. 18 years. Uh, that's a long, long time. Uh, some of this whole journey of freedom, of, of asking God to set us free and to expand our lives, um, I often feel like it doesn't come quite fast enough or in the way that I want. Um, and, and I feel that like we're caught in this in-between state a lot. But what a picture of, of needing freedom. Bound up, crippled for 18 years. Um, this is our situation. I want to I want to speak a couple words, and I'm going to go slow because a lot of times in Scripture, if we just slow down, we can we can have God meet us. And um, I want to read these words, and I want you to see if you can identify with them at all. Crippled, bent over, unable to straighten up. Man, I feel that one. Not a lot of work with that one. Uh, 
to add to this, Jesus describes her as, as bound, tied up, um, not able to fully have a range of motion. Um, because I'm a goofball and I, I like pictures, um, and I've always wanted to be like Houdini, really. <laughs> the, like, that was my first dream, I want to be a magician. And so, um, no, I'm not going to tell you. My lovely assistant won't be binding me up today, apparently. She really does that often. But, let's see here. I'm going to get a little bit bound up here. Something funny happens when we get bound up. Um, I'm not very good at binding myself, but yeah, that'll work. Uh, <laughs> keep breathing, Chris. <laughs> when we get all tied up, um, it'll be hard to turn pages. Uh, our our range. The first thing that happens is our range of motion is is gone. Like we lose our ability to fully move, um, and it's a really really good picture of what happens um, when, we, when we lose God's activity in our life. When, when sin gets a hold of us, the first thing to go is, is a little bit of being shrunk down. I can only move my hands so much, so you're gonna have to take the emphasis from all three inches here uh, of that. Um, do you know someone like this? Like you know someone who's crippled and bent over? Have you, maybe you've seen folks walking down the street. Christina, as we were driving in, we saw a lady and she was, she was like this and she was, pushing a stroller. Everything she wore was purple. It was lovely. Um, but I was thinking about, like, what is her life like? Like, her, her range of vision is everything that is down below her. Um, if she looks up, she's looking straight ahead. That's about all she gets. Um, our worlds shrink down, and, um, and you lose some of your ability. Uh, when I think of this picture of somebody who's, who's crippled and bent over, I immediately picture some of the ladies that I curl with. Um, I do curling, it's really fun. But uh, there's ladies there that have been curling like 65 years, and they, they, can, they can barely push the rock at this point. They still beat me all the time. <laughs> but uh, like there's just not a lot of motion left. I have a bad shoulder, I played too much volleyball. and. Um, it's, it's the weirdest moments when you're like going to go do something and all of a sudden like, oh, that doesn't work. Like if I work with my hands above my shoulder height for more than five to 10 minutes, my shoulders just start killing me. Like I can't do that work anymore. And I quit playing soccer because I used to play goalie. And if I dove for a ball and I was extended, all of a sudden I'd feel something go whack in my shoulder. And for the next two weeks, I could hardly use my shoulder. Um, this range of motion is a big deal. It's part of what it means to be free and fully alive. I really do wish I could move my hand right now, but I guess I'm in control of that. But um, when we get bound up, we lose that. And it happens emotionally too. I remember I went to counseling um, in Arizona. I had, I had some extra time and some extra money and I figured out I had some issues, which I still have. But um, but I went to go see a counselor and kind of as we were getting to talking, one of the things she asked me was an interesting question. She said, what makes you angry, Chris? I have a curious question now. Do any of you remember me angry? Um, she said, what makes you angry, Chris? And I said, oh, I don't have that emotion. <laughs> I don't get angry. It's just one of the things that I don't do. Yeah. And um, she goes, that's really messed up. That was actually <laughs> Kind of messed up. Um, and as we got into it, what I realized was that it was um, a lot easier for me to get depressed because it just felt a lot safer. Because when people get angry, people fight. And when people fight, things explode and then life is never the same. I had this great fear of what anger could do in a situation. Um, and so I lost that range of emotion. And so she went to work. My counselor literally started making me do exercises that would make me angry. Like, write a letter to your dad about all the things that you don't like about him. And I, like, had to, like, gradually loosen up this ability to be angry um, and to figure out how to let it out in a way that wasn't destructive. Um, I did write said letter, 
Um, and then I sent it to my dad. And then I walked into my counseling appointment. I said, well, I sent my dad the letter. And she said, you weren't supposed to send the letter. You were supposed to write it. This was an exercise for you. <laughs> I had a, a buddy of mine that I worked with in Arizona who um, he lost his range of, of motion when it came to stress. He figured out like when I get stressed I just need to work out. Like I need to get that extra energy out so I'll go to the gym and I'll work out. And the, the problem was every time that he got stressed he immediately felt like he needed to go work out. And so um, when things got hard at home he would just exit the room and go to the gym and work out. And then at work, when things got stressful, we tried to reach him and we couldn't find him. And I knew, like, oh, he just decided to do a workout in the middle of the workday because he was stressed out. Um, it wasn't his best way. He, he had lost some range of motion there. Um, when we have a problem with, uh, like, a gambler, if a gambler has a problem with gambling, what happens is, they can no longer go into a casino and have control of their life. It's taken over. They've lost their range of freedom. Um, if we have a problem with forgiveness, we lose the ability to move past being hurt. Um, and we get stuck with one thing. Oh, freedom. So nice. We get stuck with something, and, and that's um, a sense that all that person deserves is our anger and our rage and we're no longer free. And this goes on for a long time. This can be like our life. I notice um, sort of folks diverging as they get older. Some folks get more bitter and more cranky and more closed down um, and more unable to experience certain things because uh, their hearts are just getting harder. And other folks seem to get more kind and more compassionate and more graceful. Um, and they're getting a range of motion. And I think that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to open up our world further instead of have it closed down and let us get softer instead of let us get harder. Um, spiritual health is the ability to, to be uh, in an honest relationship with God through good, bad, and everything. And, and through that we get such things as um, the ability to love more and to have grace with one another more and compassion and joy and fulfillment and the ability to serve others without it being about us anymore. Um, a range of motion begins to expand when our spiritual health comes into being. Um, that's what I've experienced over the last 20 years of trying to walk with Christ. Um, and I prefer that much more to being more selfish and more hard-hearted and more closed down. The point is um, that we all get wounded along the way. Um, sin and brokenness is a part of this world. Um, and it has the potential of, change, of taking away our range of motion. And so, um, as I've been talking, have you been able to figure out what it is that binds you? What's bent you over? What's crippled you for a while? And it might even be many years. Um, do you want to be free? And you can't do that with God's help. Um, it's being unbound. It's, it's living fully. Um, and this woman, man, 18 years. And, and what's cool about her is she's still coming to worship. Uh, I imagine for Richard, coming to worship was not particularly comfortable today, um, especially when we laugh at worship. Um, and I can picture this old lady coming uh, to worship, and she is bent over, and it's probably not the most comfortable thing to walk. Uh, Christina and I got to do like uh, a trip that was on my bucket list. We went to, I'm Italian, and uh, we went to Italy. And I remember we went to this little tiny town. It was built into a hillside. And at noon, they had mass every day. And it was the church service. And 
Um, there was this lady at 11 o'clock on the dot. She left her house. She was very bent over. She had the help of her 25-year-old granddaughter or something walking with her, holding her arm. And they started out at 11 o'clock to go up the hill to worship. Um, I can imagine her life was painful and limiting. And the worst part about chronic stuff is at some level you almost have to go, man, I've got to get used to this. Like I just I accept it as how it is. It's, it's all I got. And there's a part of that that's so dangerous, which is to think that there's no hope. Nothing can change. This is where we are. Um, and maybe this woman was feeling that. Where's God? I keep showing up. Where's God? I keep asking for 18 years. Last week we talked about Lazarus and how he had gotten really, really sick. And his sisters begged Jesus to come heal him. And Jesus goes, you know, I'm not going to come for a while. Rough couple days as Lazarus uh, seemed to get worse and died. But Jesus came at the right time so the glory of God could be revealed. Part of the waiting game with God, part of the asking of God, and I've experienced this, I've been, I've been praying for my family. My first excitement about being a Christian was like, oh my gosh, I want my family to understand this too and to experience this. And so I began to pray for them and to talk to them about Jesus and to want them to be a part of it. And um, over 20 years, very little motion seems to happen uh, with my mom and dad and brothers and sisters. Um, and so I was stuck in this place of God where are you and why aren't you doing this and, and there's a little part of me that wanted to go to well God either A just doesn't care or maybe I screwed up what am I doing wrong maybe if I pulled the right lever and did the right thing and made God happy he would give me what it is I asked for I'm reminded of a passage uh, in Scripture where Paul talks about having something that's wrong with him. He, um, he says he has a thorn in his side, and most experts believe that what he was talking about was his vision was going. Macular degeneration. He later refers in some of his letters to, see, I wrote this with my own hand. You can tell because the letters are really, really big. Uh, either that or maybe he was losing his coordination or something, but... But he, he prays for God to take this from him again and again and again. And God's response to him was this. My grace is sufficient. Let me be enough for you right now. I'm not going to give you what you want, but I'm enough. And it's important in these spots where we are asking for more freedom, where we're asking for God to change something and it doesn't seem to be changing to remember that it's not because God doesn't care and God doesn't listen. Um, it just means we live in a broken, screwed up world sometimes. Uh, you see, in, in Genesis 1 and 2, we read about how God created the world, and it was very, very good. And the relationships we see there are really, really good. Like, uh, Adam is in an abundant garden. There's fruit everywhere. It's, it's a beautiful place. And then um, he has this partner that he can be with. And they are getting along just swimmingly. And he walks with God. That's actually the phrase that's used, is he walks with God. And a similar story is told uh, about what heaven is like. They see God face to face. It's abundant. There's stuff growing everywhere. Um, and, and then the fall happens, Genesis chapter 3. And in the fall, the very first thing that happens is suddenly what was abundant is scarce. And there's thorns now growing out of the ground, and he has to sweat in order for the fruit to come. Um, and the relationship between Adam and Eve goes sideways, and they start blaming each other for things. Um, Adam has a couple sons, and one of them resents the fact that the other son is favored and kills him. Um, the relationships between people go sideways. Um, and the relationship with God, Adam is found hiding from God. We live in a broken world, and um, we've made choices that make it harder. And other people make choices that make it harder on us. Um, and God, the rest of the scriptures, 
it's the story of God redeeming that, restoring that, bringing us back to the place of abundance, to fixing things, to unwinding us from the knots that have been created. Um, but this woman is suffering through that, and yet here she is at worship. Um, I love it. She can't raise her eyes to heaven, and yet she's there. Um, praising God. And um, did she know that she was going to get healed that day? I highly doubt it. I bet she'd asked a few times, probably for numerous times over the years. Um, and Jesus is actually the one who sees her and goes, you know what, you, come forward. Um, today's your day. Um, come. There is a spot um, where God just shows up and he does things. And uh, in the wonderful words of Steven Tyler, I don't want to miss a thing and so I just keep showing up. Um, don't miss that opportunity to keep coming, even if you're in that spot of, of tension and, and Jesus not showing up. Um, I knew a pastor uh, that I actually served with who um, he'd prayed for a lot of things, and they didn't seem to be happening. So he had decided prayer pretty much was just uh, something that we did to soothe ourselves. It had nothing to do with reaching God. Um, he had lost his faith in the midst of disappointment. And it's easy to do. Uh, but Scripture tells us again and again that God's a loving Father. We can ask Him for anything. Uh, but he doesn't always give us what we want, which is probably part of being a loving father, too. There's this great, um, a couple of little parables about asking for things and them not coming. One is, one is a story Jesus tells about a guy who has a guest show up at his house. It's the middle of the night, and he looks in the cupboards to, to be a good host, and he's got nothing. So he runs over to his neighbor's house, and he said, knocks on the door. Can you loan me some bread? I got somebody over at my house and I'm not being a very good host by not having anything to offer him. Can you loan me some bread? And the guy goes, dude, I already went to bed. House is locked up. I don't want to get up and give you bread. And what Jesus says is keep knocking. Because eventually the guy will get up. Um, if for no other reason than to just not be a bad neighbor for his own sake. And then he says, you know, well, if, if God's willing to do that, or, or if a person's willing to do that, what do you think your Heavenly Father who loves you would do? And then he follows that by saying, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find, knock, and the door will be open to you. Um, another story tells about a persistent widow who, uh, she's living in this town where there's a judge who doesn't give a rip about people, doesn't even care. Um, and she has a cause that she needs to bring before him. She's been treated unjustly. And, um, and the guy shrugs her off and goes, I'm not going to hear your case. And then she badgers him. And eventually he goes, fine, just so that you'll stop bugging me. I'll listen to your case. And then again he says, if that's what an unjust crooked judge would do. What do you think your Father in Heaven will do if you ask something of Him? But in both stories, you keep asking, you keep seeking. And part of exploring freedom is living in this tension of not having it yet, and yet keeping after it. Because it will come that one day, even if it comes in a way that we don't expect. I don't think she expected it. One of my first ministry jobs was to be a youth pastor at a church. It was while I was in seminary. And um, we had one of the kids in the group who was, who was really, a really uh, strong Christian. I was um, giving him a ride home, and he had just lost his grandfather to cancer. And it messed with his faith a lot. Um, he's going, man, it's like right in the center of God's will. How could God not want my grandfather to live a full life? I prayed for it. I asked God, and he didn't show up. Maybe this whole thing is just a joke. A bad joke that I have to live through. Maybe this whole God thing is just fake. 
And I asked him a question. I said, honestly, where do you think your grandfather is right now? And he said, probably in heaven. And I said, do you think he has cancer in heaven? He said, no, that's, that's ridiculous. There's no cancer in heaven. So you prayed for your grandfather not to have cancer. Sounds like God's working it out. Um, yeah, but I didn't get time with my grandfather. How long are you going to be there in heaven when you go? Forever. Well, how much time are you going to have with your grandfather? It's not the way we want it. But it comes. Um, and that's hard. Don't miss a chance because of discouragement. Keep coming. Keep asking. It's where God works it out. And he's a God who loves us and cares about us. Um, the, the proof of that is at the cross. If he's willing to die for us, he's probably willing to do most anything. But he does the right way at the right time. Um, On to the healing. You know, earlier we, we soaked in some phrases that describe this woman's um, not being healed. I, I, I want to check out the phrases that describe it. Touched by Jesus. It's a nice phrase. Straightened up. Man, that's a good one. All the areas of my life, the ones that I don't even know are broken, gradually getting straightened up. Praising God. Untied. The ability to live without <coughs> this crazy stuff anymore. Binding us up. Keeping us back. Oh, man. Better. Thank you. Um, free to move. Free to live. That's where God wants to take us. Um, do you remember getting free? Like some, some version of freedom for the first time. Maybe it was when you went off to college or something, you moved out of your house for the first time, and you're all of a sudden like, I can buy whatever I want. I am having dessert for dinner tonight <laughs> and tomorrow because there's no one here to tell me not to. Um, I remember my first car. It was my second year of college, and I bought a car off of another guy for 100 bucks thing barely ran and I lived on top of a hill so it was like praying every time would I make it actually back to the school or not um, but all of a sudden the world wasn't like my little tiny school on a hill it was Seattle I could go anywhere I could do just about anything in the town um, freedom is the ability to move the world blows wide open and suddenly there's more people and more things to connect to and when life gets bad, it shrinks down. My depression shrinks me into a little cave where it's just me. Um, I need the range of movement. I need a full life with God. I need to have motion. Um, I want to be a part of something so much bigger than myself. And that's what God is up to in our world. So how do we do it? Um, how do we actually live it? Part of it is we help each other out while we're still tied up. All of us got different tied upness and all of us have different free stuff and frankly I need you all and my time walking with you makes me better. Um, and I'm thankful to each of you for that. Another one is just keep trusting God, keep asking, keep letting him be the loving father even though it seems like his timing is scurvy and he's not giving us what we want. And then the last one is really simple. Keep showing up. Keep showing up where God is because eventually that's where the healing is too. You're not going to be able to bring it about on your own. So the only choice is to be with God. But that's a good place to be. So let's pray. God, uh, we do come here to be with you. We trust you. Uh, even though you don't seem to work the way that we want. We want freedom and we want life and that's what you say you want to give us but it doesn't always come in the way we want or when we want it. 
And so rather than give up on you, we're going to trust you. Um, and we're going to badger you. And we're going to bring you everything in our life. The disappointments, the joys, the celebrations, the thanksgivings, and the frustrations, and the asks. And we ask that you would do with them as you see fit. Because what you see fit is so much better than what we necessarily want. You're good, God. And we trust you. So we give our lives to you again and again and again. Amen. Mm -hmm.